complete great pleasure to um, introduce the first uh, speaker for um, this panel on work and activism, Nalan Bardiolu, uh, who is going to be given, giving us a paper entitled Artists for Society, Society for Artists, the Artists' Union, 1972 to 1983. Um, Nalan Bajiolu is an independent critic, copywriter, editor, and translator for organizations such as Istanbul Foundation for Culture and Arts, Istanbul Modern Museum, Apple and Radical Newspaper, and is a member of the International Association of Art Critics. She has recently received her doctorate degree, congratulations Nalan, from the University of Cambridge with her dissertation politics of the project, Radical Art in Britain, 1972 to 1979. Currently based in London, Nalan con continues to contribute to publications and exhibition catalogues. So Nalan, I will hand over to you now. Hi, um, first of all, thank you, Catherine and Amy for arranging this. Um, it's really exciting. I'll do it um, virtually. Um, so, oops. Um, I will begin um, just so that it's under 20 minutes. Um, so this uh, paper is a shortened version. It's a section from a chapter from my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, so it's uh, somewhat of a kind of short version of a proper paper. Um, so Artists for Society, Society for Artists, the Artists Union uh, between 70 Two and 83. So the establishment of the Artists' Union in 1972 was instigated by artists who came together on a grassroots level to protect and promote their socioeconomic rights as artists. At the, beginning, at the beginning of the decade, the strong presence of the trade unions seemed to provide an important ally for these politicized artists. Originating in the 1960s, trade union militancy increased during the 70s, while union membership reached its peak of 13 million, accounting for over half of the workforce by 1979. In the breakup of Britain crisis and neo-nationalism, Tom Nairn asserts that society during the 1970s was decayed to the point of disintegration in a Britain marked by rapidly accelerating backwardness economic stagnation, social decay, and cultural despair. There were five states of emergencies uh, called in just over three years between 1970 and 74, and a memorandum dated 12 December 1973 uh, by the Chancellor of Exchequer, Anthony Barber, stressed that Britain faced the gravest economic crisis since the war. When James Callaghan took over as the new uh, Labour Prime Minister in 76, the government faced severe financial problems. Dubbed as the winter of discontent, the year 78-79 saw rising levels of union militancy, including strikes by teachers, waste collectors, grave diggers, NHS ancillary workers, and local government staff. Um, at the beginning of the 70s, the British art market was still largely dominated by pre-1945 art. Uh, diminishing public expenditure from the late 60s and onwards significantly impacted what was already a very small contemporary art system, financially governed by what the artists' union would call uh, a system of state and private galleries, uh, monopoly patronage, and the continuous dispensation of establishment standards of taste. This was perhaps uh, a blessing in disguise for artists. Margaret Harrison recalls that the carrot of possible sales seemed to be disappearing and in a curious way uh, freed us up not only to consider our own economic condition as artists, but also to consider different perspectives for our work. Most of these artists were educated in British art colleges and were at the beginning of their career. Rather than fitting into a style of art production, as Harrison describes, they sought ways to use their formal education to explore issues that mattered to them, such as sociopolitical unrest in Britain, the anti-Vietnam war protests in the US, uh, the student and worker uprisings in Paris, Warsaw, Mexico City, and Berlin in 1968. In Britain, um, students and several staff members, uh, including uh, Stuart Frisley, who opposed changes to the art education, education system, occupied uh, Hornsey College of Art in London. Originally meant as a one-day sit-in uh, that started on the 28th of May, led to six weeks of debate and confrontation with local authorities. 
similar protests took place at Guildford School of Art and Maidstone College of Art and were supported by artists including Margaret Harrison and Kay Hunt, who were among the artists who would soon go on to establish the Artist Union. Um, one of the events that instigated, uh, albeit incidentally, the formation of the Union was the Art Spectrum exhibition at Alexander Palace in London, uh, August 1971. Um, it was uh, organized by the Greater London Arts Association and the Arts Council of Great Britain, uh, which featured works from 100 artists, in, which included David Hockney, Alan Jones, Barry Martin, Victor Passmore, and Yoko Ono. Like many other contemporary selection committees, uh, that's for the art spectrum was made up of curators, dealers, and critics, and included only one artist. This was um, unacceptable to several, for several artists, who were extremely dissatisfied with um, what Gary Hunt called an arbitrary and sloppy selection procedure. So instead of one token artist, Hunt advocated a selection process, including established artists who would then nominate less established and or emerging artists while asking questions such as who selects the selectors, what criteria do the selectors employ, should only artists be selectors or should there be completely open entry or no selection at all. Um, following several months of discussion, a group of artists, uh, including Conrad Atkinson, Barry Barker, Pauline Barry, Ilona Bennett, Stuart Sisley, Mark Shamovics, Grant Cook, Stuart Edwards, Gareth Evans, Margaret Harrison, Rex Henry, Gary Ann K. Hunt, Sarah Kent, Tina Keen, Mary Kelly, Carol Kenna, Robin Klasnick, Don Mason, Gustav Metzger, Jeff Sortel, Colin Sheffield, Peter Silvery, and Priscilla Trench made a commitment to the idea of a union of artists by drafting a set of aims, uh, a constitution and an agenda at a meeting which was open to public held at Camden Studios in London uh, on 18th of March in 1972. Calling for a recalibration of the artist's position in society to one aligned with workers, uh, the artists became agitators protesting the biased choices of curators and institutions um, collaborators working together with art, other artists and or non-artists, and also as art administrators uh, setting up new institutions. As Andrew Wilson asserts, uh, these artists formed an active identification with the class struggle and the rights of the worker, reflecting a move from art that questioned its own condition to one that questioned the entire role of art within society. As pioneers, uh, the Artists' Union was instrumental in shaping art policy. It had a leaderless, leaderless structure and sought to promote the rights of the artists as workers and provided a platform where artists could gather with other artists and rehearse collaborative ways of working. Um, perhaps the Artists' Union's invitation uh, you see on the screen is an opportune example um, of the working practices of these artists, especially in terms of the choice of font its monochrome, monochrome pa palette and simple message. What is the artist's union? What are artists and what are unions? The invitation contains no images, just text. It consists of these three sentences written with a font that's reminiscent of stencils, suggesting associations with a provisional and cheap process rather than a lithographic one. The stencil-like font, when closely inspected, is made, up, made of white and black spaces which resemble a monochrome camouflage pattern. Uh, the white spaces are ample enough to make printing economical in terms of ink use and spare enough to not steal from the firmness of the font. These aesthetic qualities of the invitation hint at its method of production. The succinct text written by the artist was also hand painted or stenciled by them and then printed on hand presses rather than offset press for distribution within London and beyond by these founding artists themselves. Both reproduction methods indicate an effort to minimize cost. Um, so the application by hand required more manual effort and time, yet avoided the external cost of accessing offset an offset press, despite the time efficiency of such a press. In any event, the artists sought a cheap and fast method of transmitting their message. The use of this font and the decision to utilize cheap means of production and reproduction resonates with other radical groups of the time and also reflects the terms of the formation of the union. These artists did not have the financial means to promote their ideas extensively unless they adopted a hands-on and therefore cost-efficient approach. However, these aesthetic choices were not solely due to limited funds. The artists specifically chose this font 
refrain from using imagery and utilize the whole page to make their message loud and clear, all due in no small part to their radical forebears um, from 19, May 1968 and their first-hand experience in the many protests taking place from that time and onwards. Conrad Atkinson acknowledge, acknowledges that the events of May 1968 had been formative for us. More so than a watershed political moment in France, the time had been a catalyst for these emerging artists who were stimulated not only by what the event stood for politically in terms of its failures and shortcomings, but also for its aesthetic, operational and methodical attitudes. The union's invitation was one such example. So ultimately, the artists were deliberately mobilizing activist associations. Uh, one encounters similar provisional um, and in inexpensive forms of expression in protest cards. This is significant as proof of these artists' allegiance to other radical and left-wing left movements, such as the women's liberation movement or the trade union movement, not only ideologically, but also formally. In fact, both Mary Kelly and Margaret Harrison noted in conversation that they had participated in several research-based and consciousness-raising groups, which had overlapping memberships. It was the solidarity, social activity, moral and emotional support provided through these groups and the work generated from them, both in terms of the artistic practice and academically rigorous historical work, which was yet institutionally unavailable, um, that, which provided the foundations of the intellectual project of the second wave of second wave feminism, as it was described by Griselda Pollock. Um, both Kelly and Harrison had been at the Albert Hall in London to pr protest the Miss World Beauty Contest, uh, an event um, that has been deemed the first public protest of second wave feminism in Britain. Harrison recalled participating in the protest as Miss Lovable Bra. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of that. Um, with a preformed plastic chest piece with fur nipples, while Kelly had written a critical, it was anonymous at the time, a pamphlet titled Why Miss World that framed the contest as a post-colonial spectacle. Kelly noted that the repercussions, repercussions of re recent events in France were palpable in London, where many of the art schools were occupied. Soon after, after the Miss World protest, she also marched in the then largest anti-Vietnam war demonstration in London. Like Harrison, she was engaged in several women's groups, including the his History Group and the London Wo Women's Liberation Workshop. She was, however, also part of the Berwick Street Collective, whose three other members were male. During our conversations, both artists expressed the significance of these groups, not only in terms of introducing them to theorists like Gramsci, Freud or Foucault, but more importantly for allowing them to transcend the traditional and or academic frameworks for thinking about gender, sexuality and women's oppression by providing new vocabularies and environments for solidarity. In the early 70s, the position of Marxism and the British left uh, in underestimating the effectiveness of culture and ideolo ideology was slowly beginning to be contested, especially with the English publication of Gramsci's prison notebooks in 1971. Gramsci argued that existing cultural styles are the result of social formations in which culture had been stratified into high and low and dominated by specialist intellectuals without organic li links with the broad popular masses. In opposition to this, um, a national popular culture designates the possibility of an alliance of interests and feelings between different social agents, which varies according to the structure of each national society as it was expressed by David Borgax and Jeffrey Noel Smith. What Gramsci proposed instead was, um, quote, to construct an educative alliance between dominant and sub subordinate couplings in order to establish an organic unity between theory and practice, between intellectual strata and popular masses, between rulers and rules. In this respect, uh, rethinking art practice um, was a step towards breaking down the class reductionism the domination of class over gender, race, or sexual orientation as a concern of leftist discourse um, in Britain. I argue that by aligning themselves with the labor movement through unionization, artists were able to shift focus from class to the relations of production. Moreover, by transcending the borders of the art community and working closer to society, they could transcend the cultural system of high art and its dominant visual ideology. While sociopolitical tensions provided the impetus, the theoretical 
um, the theoretical principles of the new left provided the basics for the founding of the artist union. In turn, the union laid the groundwork for art as a tool of sociocultural change and initiated several artist projects. Considering that labor unions were at their, at their strongest, um, albeit for the last time, uh, at the early 70s, the formation of the union was timely in bringing practice and bureaucracy together as part of this reformist impulse. I consider the 1970s as an interim period between the old industrial uh, mode of working and a new, more flexible one where project work had an essential place. In uh, their book, The New Spirits of, Spirit of Capitalism, Luke Boltanski and Eve Chappello contend that there are three spirits of capitalism. So first stage where uh, representing the industrial city and dating back to the 19th century, which was entrepreneurial, uh, speculative and based on industrial work. The subsequent, I would say, called the projective city, it, which was developed between, between the 30s and 60s, um, uh, with elements of centralized bureaucratic and corporatist um, systems. And the third, which they label connectionist, uh, which operated the networks and valued social capital, mobility and diversity, which they date uh, to the 1990s and beyond. Boltanski and Chapello argue that there were two forms of critique um, that have accompanied capitalism from the very beginning. Uh, first one is social critique, which was represented by the labor movement and artistic critique, uh, which was represented by intellectual and artistic circles and which focused on capitalism, uh, capitalism's dehumanizing aspects. While social critique is concerned with the inequalities, uh, misery, exploitation, and the selfishness of a world that simulates individualism rather than solidarity, artistic critique emphasizes uh, an ideal of liberation and or individual autonomy. Uh, that is to say, valuing less hierarchical and self-organized production, flexibility, which um, ultimately became determinants of productivity in the second spirit of capitalism, following the 70s. For the writers, for uh, Boltanski and Chappello, the maintenance and the legitimization of capitalism is in part sustained by the values of these anti-capitalist critiques because they can, cap they can substitute as feedback, uh, thus providing the countermeasures for maintaining, uh, resisting opposition and improving the profit profitability of the system. In this respect, uh, the authors demonstrate uh, how the new spirit of capitalism during the 1990s uh, was connected to and indirectly made possible by the libertarian critiques of the late 60s and 70s. As Sebastian Budgen argues, the challenges to bourgeois society brought forth by the left have been co-opted by this new form of capitalism, while also transforming the metaphor of the network, which was originally uh, associated with crime and subversion, into an icon of progress. I argue that the collective ways of working and flexibility in terms of work demonstrated by the multiple roles of artists in the 70s as teacher, advisor, collaborator, and manager, uh, often due to financial necessities, have foreshadowed and been, been instrumental in setting the stage for this new um, stage of capitalism, which took hold in Britain in the 80s and beyond. I consider the 70s as a limbo period between what um, Boltanski and Chappelle refer as the industrial city and the projective city, uh, especially in terms of how work was being executed. For instance, um, computers were um, not available during the 70s and union, unionization was on a downhill trajectory despite proposed uh, government measures, um, um, government measures to maintain the old ways of working, such as the Equal Pay Act of 1970, or the Industrial Relations Act of 1971. While the decline of the old way of working was imminent, there was still no new way of working. Indeed, artists whose education has uh, had prepared them for the stability of the industrial city, even though um, art practice was markedly distinct from industrial work, found themselves having to negotiate for a way of life that resembled the projective city. In 1974, Artists now, um, an independent group of art professionals, issued a report which was titled Patronage of the Creative Artist, which documented the then state of the art market. According to the report, a majority of the estimated 850 artists graduating from art schools each year 
we're moving into other sectors such as teaching, illustration, graphic design, and etc. Because of uh, because of lack of private or public support, John Walker uh, also wrote about the weakness of the art market during the 70s, stating that the British art schools trained far more artists than the art market could sustain. Artists uh, challenged this situation by establishing the artists' union in an attempt to appropriate the power and legitimacy of the labor movement to combat the institutions of art. Um, while, uh, as I said, Boltanski and Chappelle claim that the most valued characteristics of the projective city are flexibility and adaptability. But I would argue that these features are not only systematic of globalization post-89, they are also residual forms of culture that the contemporary art world has appropriated from the emergent forms of the 70s. They are residual because artists had already explored them in the 70s, despite not being the dominant forms of art practice at the time. Um, the most obvious manifestation of these characteristics is the dissolution of the traditional workplace, a process that can be traced back to several artist projects from the 1970s. One such project, um, a document on the division of labor and industry, Women and Work, 1973-75, uh, which was initiated by uh, Margaret Harrison, Kay Hunt, and Mary Kelly on the um, bottom right corner. Um, through their involvement with the Women's Workshop, uh, which was part of the Artists' Union. Um, so for this project, they, the artists moved to uh, the Metrobox Company's factory in Bermondsey. Uh, and similarly, on the bottom left, the Peterley project by Stuart Brisley replaced the gallery or the studio with the new town of Peterley. Uh, or in Stephen Willett's um, West London Social Resource Project, um, this was a West London um, neighborhood and its libraries and its streets. Um, by stepping out of the studio and more often, than, more often than not shifting the space of reception away from the gallery, these artists sought to eradicate the hypothetical boundaries of the art world and to reconnect with society at large. However, um, despite having to negotiate a living in what now resemble the third spirit, in terms of the instability and the insecurity associated with new modes of work, artists still belong to the second spirit in their pursuit of unionization. In this respect, the formation of the union represented uh, a presumably final attempt to hold on to the sense of solidarity, which was associated with a central, uh, stable and bureaucratic industry. By rehearsing collective ways of working, the union helped, uh, helped give birth to collaborative projects. Yet as working conditions began to change generally in Britain, as a result of deindustrialization, the significance of the union decreased for many members by the end of the 70s. So in a sense, uh, the union represented a mode of work which was already on the way out. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Naylan, um, for such a fantastic paper and one that I think um, really encapsulates um, so many of the ideas that we're hoping to explore in this first panel, um, both in relation to the kind of 60s, 70s and 80s, but also I love the way that you're thinking about the, the ramifications of these changing notions of, of work and labour for our present moment. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to move um, straight on to our uh, second paper now. Um, before I do that, there was one tiny housekeeping thing that I forgot to mention. And that's if you want to um, control your viewer settings um, on this type of Zoom meeting, the view function is in the top right hand corner of your screen and you can select speaker only view and you can manage your, your preferred um, viewing uh, means. So just to, just to remind everybody of that. Okay, so our second speaker um, on this panel about work and activism and, and labour um, is uh, Naomi Pierce, who is going to be giving a paper entitled No One is Free Until Everyone is Free. Naomi is a writer and curator who collaborates um, with artists to produce exhibitions, books, performances and events. Projects include 56 Artillery Lane at Raven Row in London, co-curated with Amy Budd, and Ostian at Matt's Gallery in London. Her essays, reviews, and fiction have been published by The Happy Hypocrite, The White Review, Film and Video Umbrella, Bricks from the Kiln, and Art Monthly, amongst others. 
In 2020, she completed a mystery novella as part of an AHRC funded practice based PhD researching women administrators, artist studios and gentrification at the University of Edinburgh. She is a member of the Rita Keegan Archive Project, a social history and curatorial collective that seeks to preserve and share the collections of the artist Rita Keegan and forthcoming activities um, from that project, which I'm sure many people in the audience will be really interested um, to follow, uh, is an essay collection published by Goldsmiths Press um, and an exhibition at South London Gallery in September 2021. So without further ado, I will hand over to Naomi. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yep, perfect. Great. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay. um, before I start, I should say there might be some sound interruptions um, because, um, well, unfortunately, the Home Office is trying to deport one of our neighbours and the street is refusing uh, to let them. So some kind of grassroots action as a soundtrack to my paper, which feels appropriate. Um, thank you, Catherine and Amy for organizing this. I really enjoyed um, preparing the paper today um, and I'm looking forward to um, the rest of the, the talks. Okay. So yeah, my, my paper is No One Is Free Until Everyone Is Free, The Case of Shirley Reed. Dark scraps of wallpaper scatter the wooden floor's narrow boards. A pile of pulverized debris accumulates in the corner. Despite appearing empty, the image teems with textured information. Crumbled plaster, the room is shedding its skin. Action has occurred recently, but currently the air is still. No dust particles sparkle in the rays of sunshine projecting across one mottled wall. A chunky landline telephone rests on the floor, receiver off the hook interruptions intercepted. To the right, just visible, is the sharply curved plastic handle of a dustpan, the clearing of this mess foreseen eventually. This is one of two images staged on a single afternoon in 1979 by Shirley Reed, photographer, writer, teacher, administrator, and oral historian. The second photograph is identical, except the window grill has disappeared and Shirley has materialized, crouching under the exposed glass pane like an artist might pose alongside a painting. Her chin tilts upwards, the light capturing the definition of her jawline. She wears overalls, sleeves rolled to the elbows. I imagine the dust thickening the consistency of her palms. Her gaze is strong, slightly weary, an unsmiling face as resolute as the image's sharp focus. Shirley shows me the prints one afternoon in June 2017, during the second of many interviews conducted over four years. We're sitting at her kitchen table. I don't remember taking it, she says, adding with a hint of surprise, but I like it. She remembers doing a lot of self-portraits in the 1970s, contextualizing this technique with feminist forms of self-discovery unfolding at the time. I think about 3 million women were trying to do that and I was one of them, she says. She mentions Francesca Woodman, the American photographer whose black and white self-portraits pictured disintegrating rooms of broken masonry and peeling wallpaper. In contrast to Woodman's use of surrealist motifs and often phantasmic body, Shirley's photographs appear concerned with the veracity unfettered by aesthetic intervention. They affirm her physical presence and significantly the transformative impact of her labor. I had no idea what I was doing or why, she says. I was just trying to photograph myself to see where I was. This paper draws on Shirley's experiences in the artist studio to explore narratives of self-determination and complicity. It focuses on the years 1973 to 75, when she was a living caretaker at the dairy the site of a shared studio managed by the Artist Run Initiative Space, located in a sprawling former creamery on 15 Prince of Wales Crescent in North London. Using extracts from interviews and close description of archival materials, I dissect the gender and class politics embedded in this context with a view to reframe the impact, both personally and historically, of Shirley's caretaking work. 
My interest in this legacy stems from my own experiences as co-founder and administrator of The Woodmill, a collective artist-led studio project in Bermondsey, South London from 2009 to 2016. Before I begin, it's useful to acknowledge a distinction between what might be identified as grassroots and that of DIY, a term more commonly associated with the post-war conversion of warehouses into artist studios. As David Moritz writes in an insightful essay from the 2018 anthology, Artist in the City, Space in 68 and Beyond, a publication to which I also contributed, DIY is a messy affair, as much radical world building as it is a consumer economy. Quote, it's easy to see how a DIY ethic parallels creative class values of entrepreneurship, hyper-individualism, gentrification, and advanced capital accumulation. DIY, grassroots, and artist-led activity are methods that have transformed over time. Although the 1970s were pre-Thatcherite entrepreneurialism, pre-Cameron's big society, the roots of gentrification are in this moment. Despite these associations, I'm interested in how art making might be understood as a collective action rather than an individual pursuit reliant as it is on the invisible labor of administrators and their maintenance of the context that allow creative practices to exist in the first place. I developed a forensic feminist methodology to conduct this research with the aim to produce new forms of interdisciplinary writing that trace encounters and reconstruct remains, working to impress feelings and sensations onto the reader or listener as an act of commemoration. My embodied approach is indebted to Anne Setzkovitz's work on feelings in the archive, Sadia Hartman's method of critical fabulation, and Susan Shupley's conception of matter as material witness, only effective, quote, when the complex histories entangled within objects are unfolded, translated, and transformed into legible formats that can be offered up for public consideration and debate. I conduct this process of disentanglement on administrative objects. Although administration is usually described as a process, I grant paperwork objectness in order to perceive this neglected tool of knowledge. Drawing on Mika Bao's theoretical objects, I use close description to trouble the boundaries between forms of labor, architecture, and artwork. This kind of writing doesn't lend itself to a 20 minute paper, but the method is so integral to my project, I've tried to retain it, partially at least. In the studio, Shirley's domestic and personal professional life were intertwined. Low rent meant she could live alone, while caretaking at the dairy and administrative work in her role as studio manager for space garnered responsibility towards a broader artistic community. Meanwhile, photography gave her agency, as Shirley puts it, a way of making sense of things. Shirley is self-taught and unlike many of the artists in space studios did not go to art school. She's not sure when she first seriously picked up a camera, but suspects it was at the dairy. She gestures instinctively to her shoulder while talking, recalling with muscle memory the weight of her Olympus dangling from its strap. She aligns herself with photography as a tool for social change and political activism. These views were informed by her experiences as a member of Camera Work, a photographic organization in London's East End. I cite this here briefly due to its formative impact on her career. When she left in 1984, burnt out by infighting and personal tensions, she felt as though the creativity had been, quote, leached out of her. As a result, Shirley describes her photography as a thin thread, attributing her diverse career in part to class politics and sexual difference. Quote, I didn't have the courage to risk my life to go into being a full-time artist at a point when, to be a woman, really, you needed to marry well to do it. I wasn't going to do that. I recognize fear in my turn to the past, finding myself at an impasse, unable to occupy buildings without gentrifying the neighborhoods in which they were situated. Perhaps I went into the archive looking for respite. 
for this is also the reality of grassroots work. It is under-resourced, overstretched, compromised, exposing, unregulated, exhausting. It is, it is as much evidence of state failure as it is the people's willful belief in the power of the imagination. Conversations with Shirley are charged with these negative feelings. The archive offers little respite when the interview activates its material as remains to be interrogated. In this respect, accompanying my feelings of apathy for the present, present is a desire for more accountability from the past in the hope of cultivating future artists and administrators who take care and question how they work in and with archives and cities. Shirley and I refer to this administrative object as the dairy book. It was compiled for Camden Council in 1975 in an effort to secure another building in anticipation of the artist's eviction from Prince of Wales Crescent. 35.5 centimetres in length, 23.5 centimetres wide and 3.5 centimetres thick. The cover is a black mock leather. In the top right hand corner is an empty plastic pocket the size of a business card. On the back, the tacky residue of a peeled price label. Opening the book releases a musty floral scent, the smell of old plastic stored somewhere cold. Glued to its spine are 23 warped plastic sleeves containing photographs, publicity material, handwritten notes and brochures. The sleeves cling to their contents. Sentences leave inky trails, evidence of prolonged contact and recent separation. The presentation is professional, methodical, with many materials printed in colour. A three-page opening statement typed on space-headed paper, quality stock, wove texture, sets out the book's purpose to reveal the range of talents that has been used and are continuing to use this building. The tone is promotional, apologetic for the book's hastily collated materials and grateful for the council's generosity. Significantly, the letter doesn't use the word studio, describing the building as hosting a series of workshops for artists and performers that enable them to practice or manufacture their work. This language emphasizes labor to appeal to the council on recognizable terms, valorizing productivity to legitimize the activities taking place there. After listing its 35 residents, including London Filmmakers Cooperative, Ghanaian Drummers Awake, Laminate Productions, and Infl Inflatable Makers Airworks, demands for rehousing are made. 25,000 square foot for a minimum three years of any light industrial warehousing or suitable property. Citing future work in local schools, the statement finishes with a rousing plea. We feel strongly that the dairy has contributed much to the environment and cultural life of Camden. Anonymously signed under the collective moniker of space, Shirley is listed as a named contact. But organisations are sticky. As filmmaker Tony Hill's contribution evidences, his handwritten statement beginning, Dear Space Shirley, here employer becomes an honorific and an addition to Shirley's own name. I flip through and find forms of collectivity. A faded clipping from the Express and News describes the 1974 dairy show as a chaotic mixture of our contemporary alternative society and the oldie worldie rustic scene. The text shows how dairy artists came together to host the community of the Crescent with squatters, hippies and local kids doing different activities from sound workshops to slide and tape shows, emphasizing the quote, energy and originality put into resuscitating what had virtually, what had become virtually a ghost town. The article's subtitle, A Cry from the Dairy, hints at tensions with the council who were preparing to demolish the Crescent. Unsurprisingly, the review doesn't distinguish between dairy artists and squatters. To the journalist outsider, they were one and the same. I unfold the floor plans. Pinholes in the corners, these plans have been on display. Created using phototype setting, letters and symbols carefully cut with scalpels, positioned with tweezers, pasted with rubber cement, photographed and then printed. The words 
up and down on the stairs added neatly by hand afterwards. These plans provide anatomical diagrams of the building, compressing it into administrative components, what and who was where. While Michael McKinnon's studio spreads across the first floor, Shirley's name is absent. She tells me she used other people's spaces, the co-op's darkroom, a sort of slice of John Lifton's studio. There were all these women creeping into men's spaces, she says. This is echoed by the plans. Paul Hands is crossed out with blue ink and replaced with Kate Barnard. Despite Shirley's commitment to the dairy, she failed to mark out her own physical territory within it. This absence reflects Shirley's ambivalent relationship to the studio. I've always made a little corner wherever I am for work, but it's only when it's integrated into the domestic that I can use it. In doing so, she rejects traditional conceptions of domestic space as a site of female oppression while still clinging to it, unable to fully embrace the studio. Caretaking fosters intimate relations. Shirley protects, secures and repairs, ensuring safety like a parent might do for a child. This nurturing extended to studio residents, dependent as they were on the building's survival. Surrounded by friends and lovers, the skills demanded were as much interpersonal as practical. One day moving plasterboard, the next dissipating arguments between residents. Rather than valorize this reproductive labor or confirm gender roles, as Marina Vishmit has warned, I record it here so that it might, as it rarely is, be made visible as an essential component of the production of art. The entanglement of emotion and work ethic are best expressed by Shirley's duty of care. I, I felt like I had to save the dairy, she says. This book reveals these ta rescue tactics were focused on justifying the artist studio as useful and valuable, citing the dairy's contributions to the community of Camden. This manoeuvre is now the accepted standard for negotiating space in the city, as demonstrated succinctly in a 2006 policy document for the National Federation for Artist Studio Provision, in which three arguments for studios are identified, economic benefit, cultural benefit, and community benefit. Although economic benefit would not be exploited until the creative industry policies of new labour, the dairy book shows how artist studio providers have since their foundation adopted a strategic, apolitical stance, making their case for space by stressing professionalism and distinguishing themselves from the struggles of other communities. I find more proof in another personal collection held at the Camden Local History Library. A pocket of air sucks lightly as I pull the cardboard cover of a gray archive box free. It's bursting with plastic sleeves compiled by an unnamed ex-squatter who lived at 26 Prince of Wales Crescent, a terrace house directly opposite the dairy. Amongst annotated newspaper articles, maps and diaristic fragments are a selection of photographs and ephemera relating to the dairy. One clipping steals my attention, the headline, Piano Factory Artists Aren't Squatters. A letter from artist Tom Evans sent to the Ham and High newspaper in May 76, a year after the artist left the dairy and moved to new premises secured by Shirley, a former piano factory around the corner in Fitzroy Road. Evans' letter seeks to correct the misleading impression that space artists were either squatters or an artist colony. Quote, we are not a group of any kind but individuals, he writes pitting his role as professional painter and photographer against other kinds of occupation. Artists, he continues, were putting, quote, were putting to good use buildings which would otherwise be vulnerable to squatting and vandalism. A moral judgment is being made about how space is used and who gets to use it. Despite the collective atmosphere of the dairy and the radical possibilities for creative living it proposed, Evans' letter indicates how artists bespoke creative labor with necessity and virtue, perpetuating what Kathy Weeks describes as, quote, the work ethics mythologies of work. Here, the artist studio in the X Factory, rather than reimagining values of work, reinforces standards of individual career development, identifying the artists as industrious and most significantly compliant. 
Shirley shows me a photograph taken on moving day. Graffiti along the yard wall clearly reveals the tensions between present residents. It reads, no one is free till everyone is free. I think that was the squatters, Shirley says. They thought we'd sold out because we'd been rehoused. We left them. We made the battle much harder, which I didn't think of at the time because I was just so, her voice trails off. Although she does acknowledge the complicity of artists in negotiating with the council, she frames it less consciously. Quote, what subsequently emerged, which we were a little bit naive about, was that Camden wanted to get us out because the other side of the Crescent was very heavily squatted and the squatters were going to put up a fight and Camden thought if they could get us out, they'd break the back of any fight, which, is, I, think, which I think is what happened. So they got us out on this promise of a new building and it was a very strategic move. I want to finish by returning to Shirley as a photographer. In a 1987 issue of the Woman Artist Slide Library Journal, under the heading Technical, Shirley provides a set of guidelines for photographing artwork. Quote, looking through the archive, I found so many of the slides don't do the work justice, or even that they do it a positive disservice. Her seven points offer advice on background, framing, lighting, and camera film. The first tip is revealing. Make sure you allow about three times as long as you think it will take. Treat it as a creative process in itself and spend time considering each photograph care carefully. These are the words of someone who has learned by doing, developing her skills through trial and error. I'm struck by Shirley's evocation of creativity, how this idea jars with the article's bold title. Researchers know the value of this work. Survival in the discourse is reliant on documentation. During our conversations, we often circle back to the relationship between administration and creative practice, asking ourselves how one might foreclose the other, or alternatively, how administration might be considered some kind of art. Ultimately, she believes it was a distraction. I have all my life thought, well, you just have to sort the admin out, and then you can do what you want. And the problem is to get to that bit of what I want, I'm doing the admin still. And people in the arts are quite clever at recognizing they shouldn't do admin. And they should sort of throw their hands up and say, I can't do this sort of thing. And then somebody will do it for them. I was always the person that got that bit. This paper argues for the significance of that bit. To end with an organic metaphor, that bit is the soil providing a bed without which grassroots projects cannot grow. Thank you. Um, I just wanna thank Laura Guy, Jonathan P. Watts and Shirley Reed for their guidance and feedback on this paper. Thanks. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you so much, um, Naomi. That was incredibly rich. There's so much to pull through there into our um, Q&A, particularly around the, the overlaps, but maybe also the distinctions between art making and, and grassroots activity. And it was extremely moving to listen to your paper and also listen to the grassroots activity of your neighbours um, at the moment. Um, we have time now for a really quick comfort break of uh, five minutes. So we'll, we'll rejoin at two o'clock. It's just a chance um, to give everybody a break from screens. Um, so um, take a step away, <laughs> um, do what, go and make yourself a coffee or a tea, and we'll be back here um, at two o'clock for our third paper in this panel. Great. Um, I really hope everyone's been able to have at least a brief break from the screen, um, very important um, at this time. Um, for anybody who joined after the housekeeping, just a brief reminder that um, there's live captioning being provided by stage text. And if you want to switch that on, you can do so using the live transcript CC box um, at the bottom of your screen. Okay, great. Um, so we will continue with our, with panel one with um, thinking about these themes around work and activism and labour. Um, our third speaker in this panel is Lily Evans Hill. Lily and Lily's going to be giving a paper entitled Slides Money Tell Them What We're Doing The Beginning of the Women Artist Slide Library. Lily is a postgraduate researcher and associate lecturer in the art department at Goldsmiths University of London, 
where her research focuses on the politics of collaboration in feminist art. She is a member of Group Work, Contemporary Art and Feminism Research Network, the Feminist Library Collective, and the Working Group of the Feminist Duration Reading, sorry, yes, that is right, the Working Group of the Feminist Duration Reading Group. She convenes the Feminist and Queer Archives Research Network with Hattie Nestor, and her research is funded by Chase AHRC. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Lily. Cool. Thank you. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Look out! It won't go along. Go along. Okay. Um, cool. So. Um, I want to foreground this history of the Women Artists Slide Library by tracing the idea for a slide registry um, that was carried by various groups and spaces in London and frame these as a belonging to a collective impetus and desire for a slide collection that eventually became the Women Artists Slide Library. The goal of this research is not to find a fixed history of participants, for the slide library, but trace the need for a central artist registry and meeting place to discover practices of contemporary and historical women artists. Using this motive of desire, this paper will think about the ways in which the shared urgency for a slide registry can be traced through sources found in the collection of the women's art library at Goldsmiths um, today. So these sources illustrate a history of the formation of the library as entangled with the people and places of the feminist art movement of the 1970s, um, and almost propose that the slide collective is a somewhat arbitrary grouping, resulting from various conversations, friendships, and organized groups. To this end, I want to propose that the desire for a slide registry and the energy that led to its formation was propelled by wider participants of the feminist art movement. To start, I want to briefly um, introduce the slide as a politicized object used by artists informed by feminism as a tool to discuss and disseminate work. Slide shows were organized to showcase artists work alongside each other outside of exhibition spaces. This one um, was organized by Alexis Hunter as part of the open space program at the Hayward Annual 2 in 1978. It reads, Women artists, you are invited to participate in an informal slide evening at the Hayward Gallery on September 7th, 1978, 4.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Please bring three, three slides inscribed with your name and front and top. Alexis Hunter. The text appears in the light path of the slide projector that extends to the bottom of the page. Above the projector, a hand places a minute slide held between the thumb and index finger. The, slide, the size of the slide in comparison to the light well is significant. It shows that the small object of the slide, once projected, is transformed into a pronounced image. In the context of this event, this tiny slide paired bears remarkable meaning. Some of the artists at this event might have never shown their work to an audience before. Some might not have even seen it outside of their homes or off of their kitchen table. The size of the slide is symbolic of the ability for it to project into the public, revolutionizing the image into an extraordinary spectacle, physically enlarging the picture to engulf the room. Slideshows and presentations were organized as part of smaller exhibitions too, at places like the Almost Free Theatre and the Women's Art Alliance, and were used in group meetings such as those of the Women's Workshop of the Artists' Union, where they would discuss work of historical women artists, as well as slides from exhibitions and artists outside of the UK. Of course, the slide was also used for prof professional promotion, as Althea Greenan puts it, for the attention of curators, researchers, and academics. The slide registry as an organizing resource for artists influenced by feminism was well established in the US by groups such as the Ad Hoc Women Artists Committee, um, the Women's Art Registry Minnesota, and the West East Bag um, in the early 1970s all introducing members to artists outside of their region. 
So the first trace of a slide um, library um, is found in uh, this statement by the Women Artists Collective that were a group that formed out of the Women's Workshop of the Artists Union in 1975. They presented the idea for a slide library in MAMA, a collection of writings led by the Birmingham Women's Art Group in January 1977. The group are one of the first to mention the idea of a slide collective in the British context. And they state, the underlying idea of the slide collective we propose to start is that it would give all interested women the possibility of seeing a range of work that is being done. We hope to use your slides as a basis for regular discussions, initially to see the extent to which common responses are emerging. Critical discussion of these and various responses would provide us with a clear understanding of the relative strengths and weaknesses, and we would, we hope, develop into a more fully articulated critique. We think it is important at the moment, not only for women, but for art in general, to try and develop a way of integrally involving criticism and practice in a continuous dialogue. The full extent to which women's movement methods and thinking may be relevant here has yet to be explored. This statement reads as a manifesto towards the formation of a slide registry that the group would first collect and then use to facilitate study groups. This is a logical beginning for the study, not only because it clearly states the intention of a slide library, but it identifies the parameters of the project as one born out of a collective desire for a registry that manifests in the work intention of the collective. The writing then, then identifies the next crucial step to action the slide library and traces the possibility of the library to, to transform the visible scope of women's artistic practice and to create a critical framework around it. This potential is referenced in the, vi the vision of integrating criticism and practice in a continuous dialogue. The Women Artists Collective thought of the slide registry as both a place to exhibit work and to find others, as well as a place to contextualize contemporaneous artistic practice and form critical frameworks around them. In this sense, the registry would function as a cyclical process of dissemination and inspiration, producing both social and psychic networks that strengthen the connection between artists creating and drawing from the practice of others. The statement references a slide collective, which in the nature of the registry would be creating a resource for a wider group of women they have already identified as indirect participants of the group. The statement indicates the methods in which the wider group would function um, would be through their work, their contributions to the registry and the critical discussion aided by crowd, the crowdsourced collection. The collective identify commonalities between the slide registry and consciousness raising through their reference to women's movement methods, presumably the small group organizational structure. The slide registry is identified as both a space for awareness raising about women's art, as well as the conditions, strategies and modes of working that feminist artists use. Yet this position is variable as they state that their relationship to the organizing principles and practices of the women's movement has yet to be explored. In some sense, there is an indication that the collective identify their work as encompassing the, the activities of consciousness raising, study and action groups. And this varied work intention requires a complex arrangement in which the existing small group structure might shift to carry out each task. Here, there is a realization that the collective will rely on people outside of the group for contributions to the collection and that the collective serves as a mobilization uh, for that energy. The slide registry proposed by the Women Artists Collective appears in this newsletter published by the Women's Art Alliance in um, early 1978. The registry is listed as amongst the resources available at the Alliance, although it does not declare an openness to the public. Um, art slide register, the Women Artists Collective, an autonomous group, 
are developing a collection of slides of women's art. Their office and the collection are being housed here. They will be working in close conjunction with the Alliance Collective, thus extending the beginnings of the Alliance as an arts resource center for women. This advertisement places the earliest formal address of the registry within a crucial hub of feminist creative activity in London, surrounded by other artistic projects of the movement, such as the Women's Liberation Music Projects, a group encouraging in collaboration and organizing between women musicians and a call for artists to attend a meeting in preparation for the next exhibition at the Alliance Gallery. This document claims the slide registry as a key component or in their program and in the ethos of the, of the organization. The Alliance had been set up as a women's arts and community center in 1972 and had remained fluid to the needs of groups using the Alliance, including hosting many key early exhibitions and symposiums. I would assume, however, that the slide collection um, grew out of the space as there is no trace of it staying there longer than a few months. In the early years collection of the Women's Art Library, a small manila folder labeled Slide Collective contains the only meeting notes of an early slide collective meeting dated 16th of September, 1978. At this point, the, the group do not resemble um, the original um, slide collective formed from the Women Artists Collective. Instead, we have Annie, Pauline, Sue, Flick, and Debbie, who are present with no apologies. Another name is mentioned, Tina, Tina Keen, um, and the first action on the meeting notes is for a letter to be written to Tina, either asking for or responding to a payment requests signed by the Women Artist Slide Collective. This is the first coining of the term that is documented in the archive. The notes do not give any indication of what the money is for, yet we can gather through the absence, um, through her absence from the meeting and the grouping of the slide collective without her, that there is a definite break from the um, original slide collective born out of the women's art artist collective and the new group. The agenda items also state that a history of the collective should be written, leading me to assume that the new collective has already encountered changes in makeup and circumstances. This strikes me as a peculiar priority to have when setting up a nationwide slide registry. The level of importance placed on it is somewhat telling of the intricacies to group dynamics, how, including how they are formed and who has contributed to its efforts so far. The rest of the agenda items pertain to the setting up of the slide library, including exploring forms of membership, subscription fees, borrowing and depositing arrangements, and the problems of copyright. Pauline is tasked with writing a copyright receipt for all depositors of the library. The first to contact are Kate Walker and the Hackney Flashes. Agenda point three, outlines the initial actions needed to publicize the establishment of the slide registry at the Women's Research and Resource Center, now the Feminist Library, as well as how to organize subscriptions, um, which are detailed. The collective plan to take out advertisements in various arts, organized magazines and feminist publications. Flick is tasked with contacting the GLA, presumably for funding. There is a real sense of urgency and commitment in the document, the laying out of ambitious plans and a tangible excitement that is chronicled by the distinct detailing given by the scriber. So one of the first um, adverts scheduled by the Women Artists Slide Collective um, appears in the third edition of the Women Artists Newsletter published in December 1978. The newsletter was facilitated by Monica Ross, based in Birmingham, and Kate Walker, based in South London. The publication places the Women's Slide Registry at the Women's Research and Resource Centre, and advertising the, 
and advertises the slide registry as an exciting project, which is in the process of being set up. The newsletter states that it has a distribution of 46 members, a small but established network of artists that I would assume also contributed to the content of the newsletter through co-editor groups and the letters column. I particularly love the line, subscribe or we don't survive, seen before the cut marks at the bottom of the page, um, affirming the dependence on the network of readers to keep these methods of criticism and dialogue alive. The source is then for quiet until the early 80s, um, when the concretized working group constructed a history of the collective in the first newsletter of the Women Artists Slide Library in March 1983. The history presented here ultimately leaves out many accounts, contributions, cleaning up the history into a vague but neat set of con consecutive events. But from the beginning, the Wassel was recognised as a, mov a movement-wide effort that would rely on being sustained by huge amounts of energy from people contributing to its discourse, housing it, picking up the project when the realization became too big and encouraging others to be involved. The history of the Wassel of Women Artists Slide Library, sorry, is enriched and complicated by the fluid collection of participating people and places and whatever desire, commitment and animosity that develop between them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lily. Um, I love this idea of the, the slide as a, as a political tool. And I think there's some brilliant connections there um, with uh, Naila and, and Naomi's papers. So thank you so much. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the, the fourth speaker on this panel, um, Nama Klorman Iraqi, who's giving a paper entitled Collective Grassroots Feminist Strategies Countering Media Images. Um, Nama Klorman Iraqi is a lecturer at the Department of Art History at the University of Haifa. Her research interests include political intersections between feminism, protest movements, and photography, as well as socio social political aspects of contemporary art. Her publications include the important book, The Visual is Political, Feminist Photography and Countercultural Activity in 1970s Britain, which was published with Rutgers University Press in 2019. And she has also published articles in journals such as Feminist Media Studies and Photography and Culture. Nama, do you want me to share the pre-recording? Um, and... uh, yes. Yes, yes, please. Great. Yes. Fantastic. So Nama's pre-recorded her talk for us, but will hopefully be joining us um, in the Q&A at the end. So I will just yeah. um, share that now on Nama's behalf, hopefully. Just give me one second. All right. Yeah, in the meantime, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be in such a, a rich, uh, fantastic event. Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Amy Tobin and Catherine Spencer for inviting me to participate in this fascinating uh, lecture series. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Now I will begin. The 1970s and early 1980s in Britain were marked by instability following the collapse of the welfare state, massive unemployment, race riots, and worker strikes. This was also a time when various forms of social activism emerged, including the women's liberation movement. Despite political differences among the women's movement's feminist factions, media images were unanimously viewed as having significant impact on the socialization and oppression of women and therefore as a necessary target of feminist politics. Questioning media images, um, overlapped with a broad second wave feminist view that the personal is political, that suggested that everyday experiences, among them exposure to media images, were not natural, but rather collectively shared by women and significant for understanding women's social roles. Additionally, feminists focused on advertising images 
was situated within a larger critique of Britain's post-war development into a consumer society, a process that reached its height in the 1960s as a result of a buoyant economy. Media and advertising images that produce seductive portrayals of women and commodities played a significant role in this development. Nonetheless, the economic collapse that affected consumer power in the 1970s arguably further rendered the spectrum of commodities and advertisement as an unattainable fantasy. A wave of passionate feminist opposition targeted, for instance, in the late 1970s uh, against a billboard advertisement uh, for Gigi underwear uh, that depicted a woman crossing the street at night while looking defiantly at the camera. The same woman is portrayed in a second images unbuttoning her coat and revealing her underwear. The ad is captioned, underneath her all lovable in Gigi. Rosalind Coward's essay, Underneath Were Angry, which was published in 1980 in Time Out London, at the time uh, an underground magazine, addressed the Advertising Standards Authority and argued that Gigi Ad and others similar to it create an intim intimidating environment for women. The essay added that such ads are an invitation to rape and need to be banned. A similar response to the Gigi ad can be found in Jill Nichols and Pat Moan's essay published in the feminist magazine Spare Rib in 1978, which opens, I'm alone in the underground. All around me are huge images of female parts. I don't know where to look that doesn't make me feel vulnerable. A man comes into the tunnel, looks me up and down. All these ads are like his gang, telling him that I'm waiting for him. His hand resting lightly on the lovable bra ad on her naked waist, his territory. In many ways, Cowards, Nichols, and Mode's position evoke radical feminist arguments that prevailed particularly since the 1970s. During this time, radical feminist groups like the Wavo, Women Against Violence Against Women, appeared in cities like London and Leeds and engaged in activities such as raising consciousness against violence and sexual violence against women and opposing from pornography. Splinter revolutionary feminist groups that identified advertising images, sexualizing women in pornography images as actual acts of sexual uh, violence emerged from Wavo and engaged in direct action, such as setting fire to sex shops. Such feminist attitudes towards sexualized images of women is reflected in a work by the polysnappers, taking matters into our, our, uh, into our own hands uh, the Polly Snappers were an all-women collective of photography students, uh, Joe Spence, Marianne Kennedy, Jane Monroe, and Charlotte Pembry, and they all studied at the Polytechnic of Central London. Since the mid-70s, uh, this photography program offered a strong theoretical approach to photography and set out to politicize uh, this practice. In this uh, work, dolls aim ammunition at the Gigi ad and other media representations of women. Uh, group member Joe Spence, mentioned that students were requested to produce photographs critical of an existing social order and that challenged ideological notions that otherwise appeared natural. Thus, taking matters into our own hands, humanly presents the Gigi ad and other media images uh, se uh, sexually objectifying women as targets that need to be attacked by ammunition. Joe Spence's earlier photography work also dealt with cultural system of representations. For example, her work from her project Beyond the Family Album, this is from 1979, portrayed two nude photographs of Spence, the first as a middle-aged woman and the second as an infant. Uh, the work is captioned eight and a month, eight and a half months and 528 months later. <clears throat> the Polly Snapper's work focuses on the ideological aspects of media representation. And this is situated in the Times theoretical debates on the concept of representation that reflected discursive shifts in the British left. These deliberations were manifested in theoretical journals such as the film and media journal Screen Education, which dedicated a 1980 issue to the politics of representation. The editors explained that the term refers to Ulu Althusser's view of ideology as a system of representations that employ different cultural and political, political configurations to shape a cohesive social field. Breaking away from expressive and economic deterministic readings of Karl Marx, Louis Althusser argued that ideology is a material practice 
located in ideological state apparatuses such as religious, educational, and cultural institutions. The screen education editors also emphasize the theoretical work on the concept of representation could inform political action. Parent photography, one of the essays by uh, uh, John Tad, for instance, drew on Foucault's notion of power and knowledge to examine how institutions such as uh, law enforcement endowed photography with a function of evidence and used it as an instrument of surveillance over the social field. It should be noted that during this period, the fields of photography and of photography theory were considered institutionally unrestricted since they took shape outside the academia or the museum. Feminists thusly increasingly turned to photography to produce alternative images of women as part of their political activism. Furthermore, as women were a marginalized minority in the fields of photography, undoing its image as a masculine technology and forming feminist photography initi initiatives were discernible feminist concerns. Feminist responses to media images was often carried out by other feminist photography collectives. It should be noted that working collectively was a feminist strategy informed by broader women's movements, forms of organization and decision making. Another such group was Format Photography Agency. They were active between 1983 and 1993. And this was the first all-female photography agency in Britain, whose clients consisted of commercial entities, mainstream publications, and of leftist and feminist journals. The idea uh, of establishing a commercial, commercial agency that advanced women's careers came to photographers Val Woomer and Maggie Murray following the launch of Network Photographers at then all-male uh, photojournalistic agency. According to Murray, Format attempted to influence the sphere of representation in several ways, such as picturing social groups that were underrepresented in, in the media. Format, Format members also used the photographs in ways that they believed would influence the process of the signification and for disrupting gendered expectations from various professions. According to Murray, if a client requested a photograph of a plumber or a midwife, uh, Format would send them an image of a woman plumber or an image of a male midwife. In a similar vein, Format uh, photographer Brenda Prince photographed Sue Baton, London's first fire woman, in an attempt to offer a presentation of a woman who rejected traditional gender roles. Format, Format also maintained copyrights and monitored the use of the photographs by refusing to sell clients an image uh, if the collective did not approve of its intended use. One might argue that Format's intention to control the meaning of the photographs is questionable because it implies that there was a fixed signification in its photographs that could be guarded and kept in place with a correct strategy. Nonetheless, despite Format's limited ab ability to control and genuinely capture photographic signification, its argument indicate uh, the central role that media politics had in, in the women's movements and to the extent to which images were perceived to influence women's lives. The Socialist Feminist Photography Collective, the Hackney Flashers, was another group that used photography to challenge media images. The Hackney Flashers were an all-women photography collective that lived and worked in Hackney, a traditional working-class London borough. Their name Flashers humorously translates uh, from slang as photographers and alludes to the pleasure in publicly exposing private parts, a metaphor for the photographic exposure of unjust social conditions. The Hackney Flashers consisted of a mix of professional and amateur photographers who collectively shared this, their skills. The group held workshops on darkroom techniques, design and layout methods for its members and other women. Additionally, the group credited their work to the Hackney Flashers Collective rather than to individual photographers, further emphasizing their collective feminist strategy of organization. The Hackney Flashers Project, who is holding the baby, first exhibited at the Center Prize Community Center in 1978, was organized in, col in collaboration with the Under Fives Campaign for State Funded Nurseries. This project advocated a return to Second World, World War State Policy that made nurseries available so women, and particularly working class women, could work outside the home. Uh, this project included photographs as well as advertising images, graphics, text, and montages. Uh, one of its panels, as you can see here, headlined Don't Take Drugs, Take Action, incorporated a psychiatric drug advertisement that depicted a white working class woman next to a baby, baby carriage and she's angrily grabbing at a child's shoulder. 
soldier's shoulder, sorry, and a large image of the woman's agitated face uh, is superimposed on the advertising and uh, emphasizes her distressed and anxious expression. The image is captioned, adverse circumstances such as too many children and too little money are recognized as causes for neurotic depression or anxiety neurosis. Um, now below the advertisement was a photograph by the Hackney Flashers of a group of Hackney women and children marching with placards captioned, uh, parents must unite to fight and nursery is my right. Thus, by juxtaposing these two images, the Hackney Flashers aim to undermine the adverts portrayal of women as passive victims and to argue that women became distressed by adverse social, social conditions, conditions. Sorry, Among these conditions were the absence of adequate childcare and the necessi necessity to work both outside and inside the home. Moreover, they implied that by taking collective action rather than uh, using psychiatric drugs, women were adept at finding their own solutions. Additionally, the Hackney Flashers intended that working class women for Hackney viewing the show would identify with its message and be mobilized into taking feminist action. The Poly Snappers, Format Photography Agency, and the Hackney Flashers were feminist photography collectives that engaged in feminist countermedia activity and set out to challenge gendered stereotypes and expected uh, social roles. The group's activity was situated within the Times feminist view that the personal is political, the perceived political role of photography and feminist collective forms of organization. The photographs produced by these collectives reflected different feminist arguments regarding the representation of women in the media. The police snappers responded to the sexual object objectification of women in advertisements like the DG ad and evoked radical feminist stances against sexual violence against women. Format challenged media representations of women's social roles and set out to expand their social positioning. And the socialist feminist collective, the Hackney Flashers, used photography to raise public consciousness to the needs of working class uh, mothers living in Hackney and to mobilize them into feminist political action. The police snappers format and the Hackney Flashers were nonetheless all implicitly suggested that media images were limited and ideologically distorted. In contrast, they perceived the photographic interventions as capable as going beyond the language of photographic representation and as tools for better exploring and articulating women's experiences, shared elements of oppression and social roles. Furthermore, such feminist practices not only challenged the sphere of representation, but also contributed to the shaping of the material forms of photography activism and to the distinct political arguments and forms of organization. Thank you for listening.